made the biggest difference by moving to the UK when they don't <laughs> have as much fun. <laughs> I believe that women are told that, you know, years of tension is coming out of your facial, facial muscles as we do this. So that's probably not right. N- not directly, no. no. I think everyone can tell people often look a little bit more relaxed when they come back from holiday. And so probably there is a, a little bit of that kind of tension for the muscle tension side of things. But it's not actually a contribution to skin ageing. Uh, the major contributions, as I mentioned, are genetics, avoiding sun exposure, but also avoiding smoking, excessive alcohol. And, you know, the sort of messages that our grandmothers and great-grandmothers gave us years, years ago and always promoted getting good sleep and regular exercise, those kind of old-fashioned, very simple measures, measures have actually proven to hold true. If, can we run with the idea, if just for a second, that you can massage your face from the inside... Can, could you do that with food? Like, could you Mas- just massage food? Yes. Well, because apparently the, Megan's therapist puts her hands inside Megan's mouth and rubs it around. Yeah. What if you just filled your mouth with chicken good and thinking. squished it around? Would that do the, um, that, or a that, is a, that is a good question, and probably what would be more effective is food that we associate with higher fibre that you need to chew a lot more to digest and it would have not only a, a, an improved massage effect on the inner mouth but you're also providing better nutrients and uh, also the sort of prebiotics yes. that, so that it's, it's, like that's a, brilliant it's a workout it's a workout for your no. for your face you could have started so, something don't go to the gym just eat some the fiber diet high yeah. fiber fiber face diet high fiber facial well, well, yeah. a sort of diet that is currently being promoted for a whole lot of reasons and that is the sort of more natural vegetables and fruit the sort of things that used to be said your great grandmother would recognise had come out of the garden. So the sort of um, reduced processed food uh, that has a higher nutrient value, and as you say, it becomes packaged as, as nature intended. So it comes with it the sort of cofactors and coenzymes, and comes with enough fibre that fills you up so that you're probably not overeating excessive calories. And moreover, it causes um, less of a carbon footprint. Great. Uh, locally God, we can and save the world. We can save the world with it. This is no, why no. squirrels look so young, right? Because they just fill their cheeks up with nuts. <laughs> Where did squirrels come from? I, think, well, I was just thinking about filling my, my oh, yeah, mushka with mean. nuts Sorry, and slow. the cheeks of the... So that's squirrels. So this, basically, we could save the world like this. this well, is you already have. Low carbon, high... Yeah, Ab- absolutely. And, and nuts, as you rightly pointed out, they yes. contain some fat-soluble vitamins and so forth that have antioxidants and the kind of things that reduce the oxygen, free radicals and so on that we in, encounter on a day-to-day kind of exposure even with the sun and wind and other various things so so you're quite right I mean it's coming back to more natural ways of keeping yourself healthy anti-aging and is better for us personally as well as our local and global environment that's fantastic I'm gonna open a clinic I want to open a clinic I can see your clinic in your eyes eat your way to use (laughs) I just wonder how many people are massaging their cheeks now as they listen to this and thinking yeah that, that actually is that feels better it's working yeah Louise, lovely yeah. to talk to you. And I, I, I was going to ask you about the use of moisturisers, but I've run out of time. Sounds Another great. time then, Jim. All right, and be, that's great. Look, Dr. Louise Reich on the panel regarding how Megan stays so youthful. Uh, Michelle, well, she is youthful. That's the, the real well, thing. That may have helped. Michelle Court, thank you so much. <laughs> My pleasure. And Martin Cocker on the panel too today. Thanks, Martin. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. That's us. Here's Checkpoint. Tonight on Checkpoint, Mycoplasma bovis. Checkpoint can tonight confirm uh, the Z Stratton farm in Winton, where Mycoplasma bovis is believed to have originated as early as 2015, used a vet 1,600 kilometres away. We speak to MPI and we ask, could M. bovis have been detected earlier? The government ditches plans to replace the decile funding system for schools with targeted child subsidies. The Kiwi industry's staffing crisis. Why can't they attract workers? Our reporter Zach Fleming travels to Pies Pa to work as a picker and then a packer. The European Union Union gives the green light to start negotiations for a trade deal with New Zealand and Australia. And Paula Bennett leaves Parliament at speed. 
RNZ News at 5. Kia ora, good afternoon. Call Katrina Bat in a ho. The government had stitched plans to get rid of the school decile funding system while it considers a fundamental overhaul of school resourcing. The previous government wanted to end deciles in the next year or two, but instead school decile numbers will be recalculated for 2020. Our education correspondent John Gerritsen reports. Schools had been looking forward to the end of the decile, a number from 1 to 10 based on the proportion of children from poor neighbourhoods. The previous government wanted to replace the system with targeted funding based on risk factors such as whether children's parents are on benefits. But the Labour-led government is considering extending the targeting approach to other forms of resourcing, such as the number of teachers at each school. It says while that work is being done, the decile system will continue. Cor John Gerritsen, in TNA. Infected milk is shaping as one of the reasons Mycoplasma bovis has spread from Southland to Waikato. So far, 38 farms have been deemed to be infected with the cattle disease. Waste milk is sold to farmers rearing calves. But milk from cows with Mycoplasma bovis is highly infectious and the calves it's fed to are highly vulnerable. A Southland-based vet, Mark Bryan, led a study on waste milk and found farms were selling it to others up to 130 kilometres away. I sort of naively thought oh, it probably goes five or ten k's, but it goes a long way. And some farmers have just too much of it, and uh, and they want rid of it. So you know, good milk that's not infected is is a great uh, source of feed for calves. But if it's containing M. bovis, it's it's highly infectious. Mark Bryan says a way to track the movement of waste milk needs to be introduced, similar to the system used to trace the movement of cattle. Auckland Council has announced a new housing development in South Auckland. Auckland Council's development arm, Panuku, has partnered with Auckland Iwi Te Akitai Waiohua and the Housing Foundation to build 300 homes over the next five years, Sally Murphy reports. The homes, which will range from one-bedroom apartments to four-bedroom houses, will be built on an empty site on Barrowcliff Place in Manukau. At least half of the 300 homes will be sold under an affordable housing scheme, but prices are yet to be set. The Mayor, Phil Goff, says there will be a range of buying models, including rent-to-buy and shared equity, to help ensure affordability. Mr Goff says the development will be comparable in scale to the transformation of Wynyard Quarter on Auckland's waterfront and will create a new hub in the south. Earthworks are already underway, with construction set to begin later in the year. In Auckland, Sally Murphy. The National Party says its confidence in the Speaker of the House has been severely shaken because of events in recent weeks. National's Deputy Leader Paula Bennett stormed out of Parliament's debating chamber this afternoon in frustration over Trevor Mallard's behaviour as Speaker. He in he's introduced a new system of discipline, deducting questions from MPs who interrupt proceedings. During question time today, National's Jerry Brownlee objected after Mr Mallard took five questions away from the opposition. Mr Brownlee said the Speaker was effectively hampering democracy and Mrs Bennett jumped to his defence. A Kapiti Coast District councillor has been found guilty of indecently assaulting a council staff member. David Scott, who's 71, was on trial in the Wellington District Court, accused of rubbing his genitals against the woman during a council morning tea, Amory May reports. The Crown said what made David Scott's actions indecent were his grabbing and holding the woman while he rubbed himself against her. The defence said the complainant had exaggerated what happened and while Mr Scott accepted he had moved past the woman, that was not accompanied by any criminal intention. The jury deliberated for three and a half hours before returning its guilty verdict. The defence lawyer Mike Antonovic asked Judge Hobbs to not enter a conviction against Scott as a discharge without conviction will be sought at sentencing. David Scott was remanded on bail until sentencing next month. This is Anne-Marie May. Three First World War soldiers' diaries will be returned to New Zealand more than 40 years after they were taken. The diaries of Cyril James Claridge, Hartley Valentine Palmer and Clifford James Walsh have been held at Leeds University since being taken by military historian Peter Liddell in the 1970s. The Ministry for Culture and Heritage says their removal didn't breach any cultural heritage legislation at the time. But after an investigation into the origin of the three 1915 diaries, the university has agreed to return them. It's five minutes past five. Sport, the captain of the New Zealand women's world rugby winning rugby team. Let me start that again. The captain of the New Zealand women's World Cup winning rugby team 
Fia Oo Faumasili has come out of retirement to take up one of the inaugural Black Ferns contracts. New Zealand Rugby has named 28 players to receive the new contracts worth between forty and $45,000. The 37-year-old Fa'u Masili from Auckland is a police officer but won't be giving up that role. Last year I said that you know, I've, I've hung up my boots but I think through summer I've still been training. I'm still feeling fit, body's in good shape, um, talk with the coaches and you know, I want to be a part of this team with, in this new era and um, I mean, we've got a lot of new caps coming through and so just having probably an old experienced head in there um, could definitely help. The Black Ferns have just three matches confirmed so far this year, two against Australia and one against the United States. The mainland tactics coach says the sending off of Northern Stars mid-quarter Fa'amu Yuani in the ANZ Netball Premiership match last week shouldn't have been a surprise. The matter is still being investigated by Netball New Zealand. But the tactics coach Marianne Delaney Hoshek says umpires made it clear to team officials before the competition started how they were going to control the game. In the pre-season, the umpires had told us you know that they would be trying to tidy things up so at pre-season there were a lot of warnings and a lot of that kind of thing and if players said anything back to the umpires they were really strict on those sorts of things. The tactics play the stars in Christchurch tonight. That's the news. The EU wants free trade with New Zealand. The European Union wants to look to people that are in their sort of same vein on the trade front. Is it worth it? One to two billion dollars additional exports every year is not to be sniffed at. What's at stake? Feta, parmesan, brie, camembert, you know, all these traditional European terms they could be trying to restrict. Hopefully we'll still have cheddar cheese uh, in New Zealand, <laughs> otherwise it's going to get quite confusing. Cultured Radio, Morning Report with Guy and Espiner and Susie Ferguson, weekdays from 6. Then on 9 to noon, some backcountry farmers are closing walking tracks across their land, saying too many tourists are causing them problems. And after 10, Sally Wainwright, the highly regarded British screenwriter behind Happy Valley and Scott and Bailey, on writing female-led detective series and killer storylines. Join me, Catherine Ryan, on 9 to noon after Morning Report on RNZ National. Met service, weather through to midnight tomorrow, northland to Manawatu, including Coromandel Peninsula, Bay of Plenty, Taupo, Taumiranui and Taihape. Showers, some heavy with hail and thunderstorms, easing for a time overnight or tomorrow morning. For Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, fine breaks, a few showers mainly about the ranges. Horufenua to Wellington, Wairarapa, Marlborough and Canterbury, long fine breaks, isolated showers in the afternoons and evenings, possibly heavy with hail, but dry for the Canterbury Plains tomorrow. For Nelson, mainly fine, but showers about the western ranges spreading elsewhere tomorrow. Buller, Westland and Fiordland, mostly fine today. However, showers developing in Fiordland this evening. Squally showers everywhere tomorrow with thunderstorms and hail. Heavy snow above 400 metres south of Haast tomorrow. Otago and Southland showers with snow to 300 metres at times, clearing for a time this evening and overnight. Thunderstorms in the south tomorrow. And the Chatham Islands, periods of rain with possible thunderstorms. It's eight and a half past five and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina, and thank you everyone for joining us. We begin tonight with mycoplasma bovis. Could MPI and therefore the country have acted earlier? Could the Zeestraten farm in Southland, on which the infection appears to have originated, been quarantined, thus preventing the spread of the disease? Now, MPI will consider this as part of their investigations. But MPI weren't alerted to Mycoplasma bovis by the Zeestraten farm. They were told by South Canterbury farmers where animal welfare concerns led to a vet contacting Massey University and then to MPI being notified. So what did the vet see or not see on the Winton farm belonging to Gia and Alphonse Zeestraten where it's believed the outbreak did begin? Were there symptoms? Sometimes there's not. Were any symptoms treated that might have raised a red flag if someone with the knowledge of Mycoplasma bovis had been alerted to them, as happened in South Canterbury? Checkpoint has, has exhaustively sought to track down the vet who saw the stock on that Winton farm. We called the Zeestratens themselves and asked Gia. Uh... I don't give names at the moment, sorry. OK, because you had Vet South, didn't you, until 2008, and then Vet for Farm from 2008 to 2012. Who took over after 2012? Uh, you better talk to my husband about it. So we called her husband, Alphonse Izzy Stratton, repeatedly, and all we got was this. G'day, Alphonse here. Please don't leave me a voice message. 
please call me back later. If I do not return your call or if it's urgent, please send me a text message. I will get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you. So we texted and texted again, no response. But we are tonight able to reveal that two Southland-based vets had earlier ended their relationship with the Z Stratons. One was Vet South, highly respected in the region with multiple clinics throughout Southland, including in Winton where the Z Stratton farm is. They stopped visiting the farm in 2008 after differences over animal care. A smaller local practice then stepped in, Vet for Farm, but their relationship with the farm ended in 2012, well before Mycoplasma bovis was there. No one could tell us who took over vet duties on the farm after that. We asked MPI's Director of Readiness and Response, Jeff Gwynn. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. I don't know off the top of my head. Was there a vet? Was there a Southland vet, a local vet, visiting the Z Stratton property? Uh, the Z Strattons do have a vet, but I don't believe that vet is local. So if there were symptoms and mastitis and real distress associated with mastitis seems to have been the symptom that alerted people in the Van Leeuwen farm in South Canterbury, if there were symptoms, who would, uh, who would have detected them? Well, the animal welfare responsibility sits with the farmer. So the farmer is obviously in the best position to understand the health of their herd. And if the farmer has any concerns, it's up to them to notify their vet. Why doesn't MPI know where their vet's located? Isn't it material what the vet saw, what symptoms the animals were presenting with on that Winton property? Look, I think what's material to us is that we establish the farm through our tracing activities. And once we confirm through um, laboratory testing the presence of the disease on the property, we then lock that property down and it's been under regulatory control ever since. Jeff, has MPI spoken to the vet? Uh, look, MPI conducts a full investigation into all of the farms that are under regulatory control and we will speak to a number of people to establish uh, when the disease arrived on the property. Uh, but I'm not going to go into detail of all of those investigations. No, no, but hold on. This is really material, isn't it? Because this is the farm from which it is now thought Mycoplasma bovis originated in this country, isn't it? At this stage, it's our earliest recorded um, expression of a disease in New Zealand. Yes. So, so have you spoken to the vet that was working with this farm? John, I'm not going to comment on the... No, I really need you to comment on it, Jeff. I really need you to comment on it. This is absolutely no. material. You're not even able to tell me who the vet is or where they're from. Have you spoken to them? We have conducted a number of compliance and technical investigations across New Zealand in relation to all of the infected properties. Have I'm you spoken Have you other. spoken to the vet that was working on the Z Stratum property in Winton where Mycoplasma bovis originated? I'm not prepared to comment on ongoing investigations and there are a number of them occurring across New Zealand. I'm not asking you to comment. It's a simple yes or no question and I'd really like a yes or no answer. Have you spoken to I'm the vet? I'm not prepared to answer the question, John. Let's talk about what happened on that uh, Van Leeuwen property in South Canterbury then. What I've heard, and I'd love it if you could confirm this, is that there was a sheer milker there who looked at the symptoms and, symptoms and thought something is awry. He or she immediately consulted an expert, as was entirely appropriate. The expert then called in Massey University, I believe, who said, this looks like trouble to us. In other words, they blew the whistle correctly and directly, and Mycoplasma bovis was identified there. That's all correct, isn't it, more or less? Yes, they rang our 800 number, which is the first um, MPI I heard of it, and that's the right thing to do. And then obviously subsequently tests were done by our labs, uh, which confirmed the presence of mycoplasma bovis on the property. So the South Canterbury property blew the whistle on the basis of animal welfare issues. Mastitis in particular, we understand, but there may have been other symptoms as well. Yes. Did the same happen at the Z Stratton property in Winton? Look, the Winton property was found through our tracing. Uh, in fairness, some of the um, clinical symptoms of M. bovis can actually be confused with other diseases, like mastitis does occur under a variety of conditions. But in this instance, um, the property in Winton was discovered through our tracing efforts. You've told me previously that the property in Winton 
was being serviced for want of a better description by a vet who wasn't based in Southland? How was that vet able to assess the symptoms? Well, I think that's a question you'd be better to ask the Zee Stratons or the vet themselves. Have you any sense of when Mycoplasma bovis was first on the Zee Straton farm? What we have is a great deal of work done by our technical experts and uh, the Massey uh, Epidemiological Centre. And the genetic clock, which shows the introduction, is likely to have been either December uh, 2015 or January 2016. So... It's possible it was there as early as December 2015. That's the, the evidence we have to date. MPI's Director of Readiness and Response, Jeff Gwynn. So if it was on the farm in 2015, it took two years for MPI to find out about it. Who was the vet and what did they see? After we did that interview and just before we came on here tonight, we spoke to a veterinary clinic on Waiheke Island just off the coast of downtown Auckland. Despite being 1,600 kilometres away from the farm, we had been told they had worked with the Zestratons. Vets on Waiheke is the practice. The vet is Alexandra Gilmore. She wasn't available to talk to us, but we asked her husband, Stephen, who manages the practice, if they have worked with the Zestratons. How often did you go to the Zestraton farm in Winton? Um, uh, I can't, I don't know. Um, I know that we uh, have, tr we try to have six monthly visits, basically, yeah. Try to have? Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the aim, is to get down every six months. Do you get down every six months? Yeah. Sorry, was that a yes or a no? Yes, yes, yes. What expertise do you have in the area of mycoplasma bovis? None. Myself, I don't know um, if you'd, you'd have to talk with Alex about what she knows about it. She's, she, yeah, I, I, I don't know what uh, what she knows about it. Has she studied bovine health? Yes. So she has some experience of working with cows because there aren't many on Waiheke Island, are there? The, yes, she has experience, yes. And there's a few here, but yes, no, she's had experience. How, how long have the Zestratons been your clients for? Um, we took over the practice about two years ago, um, and so I, th I guess they've been with us for roughly that length of time. I'm not 100% sure when you know, things started happening with them, but uh, around about that length of time. Were they already with the practice? Were they already clients of the practice? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Has your clinic on Waiheke been visited by MPI staff as part of their investigation into mycoplasma bovis? We were audited by them recently, so I, I assume it was in relation to that year. Audited, was it a routine audit or an unusual audit? It was an unusual audit, but it was an audit. They just wanted to make sure that all the paperwork was, in, in, uh, was correct and that things were happening as they were meant to happen, and, and that's what they found, that nothing was untoward. Were you given warning that they were coming in? Or, or no, no what? They, just, they just turned up. And you believe it's part of their investigation into uh, the mycoplasma bovis oh, infection? I, yeah, look, you know, I, I can't give you my... That it's 100% the case, but of course that's what I would assume. Stephen Gilmore telling us that vets on Waiheke were the Zestratons vet. We want to talk to the Zestratons about why they would use a vet on Waiheke Island uh, off the coast of downtown Auckland. They have still not returned our call. We want to talk to Alexandra Gilmore about what she saw. Were their symptoms on that farm consistent with the Simpsons, uh, symptoms displayed by cows with mycoplasma bovis? We're still waiting to hear back from her. We will update you on what we learn about this, this, remember, is the farm where Mycoplasma bovis originated. The government has ditched plans to get rid of the school decile system while it looks at an even more fundamental change to the way schools are funded. The previous government wanted to replace deciles in the next year or two and instead target the same pool of funding to individual children with risk factors like parents on benefits. Now the new government is considering applying the risk index to the entire school resourcing system, including the number of teachers at each school. Here's our education correspondent, John Gerritsen. 
Low decile schools were looking forward to the end of the decile system, which allocates about $130 million a year based on the number of children from the poorest neighbourhoods. But the new government says the system will have to stay for a few more years yet. The Education Minister, Chris Hipkins, says he wants to do more work on the risk index the previous government developed to replace the decile. But it's not necessarily going to be applied in the way the previous government had intended. We're going to um, look at how we can use the insights gained from the risk index to inform all of the resourcing decisions we make about education, not just a very small percent of school funding. Chris Hipkins says that could mean poor schools get more teachers or more help for children with special needs. What we are looking at is how the insights from that data set can be used to better target learning support, for example, additional teacher aids, how it might be used to better inform decisions we make about additional teachers or other additional resources for schools. Fetu Cormac from the Principals Federation says some people will be surprised that the decile is being kept. This may come as a surprise to many of our colleagues and teachers, considering that the previous government had done quite a lot of work around reviewing the decile uh, rating. Otahuhu College is a decile one school. Its principal, Neil Watson, says the decile is sometimes misunderstood, but a delay to removing it is OK. If there's going to be a change to um, funding formulas for schools and, and possibly staffing formulas, then it makes sense to actually do that change in one go and look into it in detail. The decile funding is a valuable resource for us. Neil Watson says low decile schools definitely need more funding than high decile schools and they also need a way of attracting the best teachers. In terms of the numbers of teachers, I think the key issue is not so much the number of teachers but the quality of teachers and being able to attract and retain the very best teachers in schools where, where the kids need the most help and support, I think it's really important. At Windley School in Porirua, Rhys McKinley is not convinced targeting at-risk children will be better than deciles for allocating extra funding. But he says schools in poor communities need more help and he hopes the new system will provide more funding and more teachers. At the moment I'm OK with what we've got, but if it meant that it would have increased staffing and that it would lessen our use of our ops grant to fund more teachers or more teacher aids, then that would be a good thing for us as well. Meanwhile, school deciles will be recalculated based on this year's census, with new decile numbers applied in 2020. Mō te hōtaka o te ahi ahi, ko John Gerritsen tēnei. Coming up to 23 minutes past five. A fortnight ago, the Kiwi fruit industry self-declared a crisis, saying it was 1,200 workers short, mainly pickers and packers, for the season ahead. That crisis hasn't subsided. The industry is still 600 short, despite help from MSD and a steady stream of media coverage. Now, several reasons for that have been thrown around. People who've picked in the past have told us the work is back-breaking, almost literally, and the pay doesn't make up for that. Then growers got in touch saying that's not true. New Zealanders are just lazy, they said, and suffer from, and we quote, a benefit mentality. So we wanted to draw our own conclusion. We sent Zach Fleming, who's never picked fruit before, down to the Bay of Plenty to give it a go. We're now the largest horticulture industry in New Zealand, worth around $2 billion last year and will be greater than that this year. Zespri's profit after tax was $35 million in 2016. This year, it's forecasting 170 million. That's a six-fold increase in three years. So with all that money floating around, why is the kiwifruit industry in a self-declared crisis? It means our pack houses were running at around 25% less capacity than they would normally. Nikki Johnson, the CEO of the Kiwi Fruit Growers Incorporated, or KGI, pleaded a fortnight ago for 1,200 pickers and packers. A bumper crop combined with fewer international students and backpackers to pick the fruit spelled disaster. So we used to have a number of business schools operating in the region uh, that had international students that were a key part of uh, our harvest crew. Those schools are no longer operating here. In terms of the backpackers, I think what we're experiencing is that the unemployment rate across New Zealand is quite low and so backpackers have more choices. And they're not choosing kiwi fruit picking. Headlines have the problem. But the crisis is not yet averted. The industry's still 600 pickers and packers short. So why don't people want these jobs? 
Driving down to the Bay of Plenty from Auckland, we saw sign after sign and even some billboards advertising for kiwi fruit picking jobs. We've heard from growers who say that kiwis are lazy and they don't want to do this hard work. We've heard from past kiwi fruit pickers who say that the work is too hard and the pay's not good enough. But how hard is it really? We wanted to figure out for ourselves. The short answer is physically, it's tough. Kiwi fruit grows on horizontal overhead canopy vines. You reach up, pick, and place the fruit in a front pack that holds 20 kilograms. Picture a giant baby front pack carrier. At only 5 foot 10, 178 centimetres, I was shocked to be told on arrival I was too tall to pick, but quickly discovered why. I had to crouch under the vines, some hung as low as my chest height, so I was forced to hunch over, knees bent, or lean backwards while I progressively strained my back. All right, so it's been exactly five minutes. I've filled up two bags. These bags weigh 20 kilos each. Now, I like to think I'm pretty fit. I go to the gym, go for runs four or so days a week, ride my bike to work every day and back as well. But five minutes, I'm kind of puffing. My back's actually quite sore from hunching, uh, crouching down to pick these kiwi fruit. Um, this definitely isn't an easy job and if you weren't very strong you'd find this incredibly difficult to do for eight hours a day. Some pickers do it for longer, 10 plus hours a day, though they can take a one hour unpaid break. There weren't any women in sight. The pickers I talked to all said it was hard work. Shoulder pain. Shoulder pain? Yeah, yeah. Hard job. Sore back? Sore back. Most said they didn't enjoy it, but the back pain becomes manageable after a week or so, once the body adapts. The orchard owner told me a fast picker here can be paid around $25 an hour, but we were brought here by KGI, so that's likely to be as good as it gets. A quick Google search for kiwi fruit picking jobs in New Zealand and you'll find many paying the minimum wage or close to it. I picked for 25 minutes and what I gained the most was empathy. I can imagine that for people who aren't physically inclined and maybe are a bit more inclined to give up when things get tough, if you did this for a couple of days and your body was really sore before you got used to it, you might just say kiwi fruit picking's not for me. The orchard owner wasn't happy with that assessment. After previously agreeing to an interview, he changed his mind. On top of the physicality, there's the complete lack of job security. It's only a job for three months of the year and kiwi fruit can't be picked in the rain, or even if it's still wet from rain. Try and tell your landlord you can't pay your rent because it rained this week and you had to stay home. The industry is aware of these problems. It's trying to move toward full-time jobs. Pick in summer and autumn, prune in winter and TBC in spring. I could only pick for 25 minutes because I had an appointment with KGI CEO Nikki Johnson. She told me a KGI survey found the average wage across growers has increased to $21 an hour. But she acknowledged... When you average that over the number of hours available in a week that it rains, is that enough? The industry is 600 workers short, which suggests it's not. Regardless of whether it's minimum wage, 25, 30, 35, clearly the market has deemed that kiwi fruit pickers aren't being paid enough because they don't want to go and do it for the wages that they're being offered. Which is why you've seen an increase from what would have been a minimum wage um, position to now $21 an hour. That but what I'm trying to get at is perhaps it's still not enough. Uh, and, we, and we don't know that at this point. We've, I mean, that's something that we've seen the increase go to this year. Uh, I think we've got a real perception issue that people think it's a minimum wage job. And so if um, we, we can't really say if, if people knew it was $21 an hour or more, because that is the average, uh, would that attract them to the roles? And that's what we need to understand. Uh, I would say based on the responses that we've had that $21 an hour is enough. KGI's office is in the same building as Zespri in Mount Monganui. The two are closely linked. Most growers have shares in Zespri. And remember, Zespri is forecasting a $170 million profit this year. It's building new headquarters, predicting a doubling in staff. And it's new red kiwi fruits about to hit the market, which I'm told can sell for $6 each in Asia. Uh, Pre-commercial, but there are some trials happening at the moment which are really exciting. Given all that and the fact the entire industry would grind to a halt without pickers, 
Could sharing that 170 million around a bit more lure people in? It's a give and take situation and it'll something that'll play out as we understand the labour market a bit better. In the meantime, next season's expected to start the same, with a large worker shortage. For Checkpoint, Zach Fleming. And Zach's story was shot and edited by our excellent cameraman Nick Monroe. Now, ACC received at least 23 claims in 2016 and 15 last year for kiwi fruit picking injuries. That works out to around one or two a week across the season. While he was in the Bay of Plenty, Zach also visited a kiwi fruit packer. We'll have his report on the minimum wage workers there tomorrow night, which includes an admission from the packing company that it is, and I quote, shit work. <laughs> with Checkpoint on RNZ. Thank you for being with us. Coming up on the programme, the Christchurch Mayor calls for staff to consider lowering chlorine levels in drinking water after hundreds of complaints. Paula Bennett walks out of Parliament. In Manchester marks one year since a suicide bomber killed 22 people, some of them young children, at an Ariana Grande concert. We'd love your feedback. Do text us 2101. You can email checkpoint at radionz.co.nz. And we are, of course, on Twitter and on Facebook, where you can watch stories like Zach and next one on kiwi fruit packing uh, business next including an answer to a question about petrol prices from last night but before it all katrina batten with the headlines infected milk is being implicated in the spread of mycoplasma bovis in cattle from southland to waikato waste milk is sold by dairy farmers to those looking for a cheap way to feed their calves but milk from cows with mycoplasma bovis is highly infectious and the calves it's fed to are highly vulnerable a new study has found it was sold to farms up to 100 30 kilometres away from the source farm. The government is ditching its plan to scrap the school decile system. It says the risk index could be applied much more widely, such as to the number of teachers at each school, and while that's been considered, the decile system will continue. School decile numbers will now be recalculated based on this year's census data. A new housing development in South Auckland will deliver 300 homes over the next five years. The homes, will, which will range from one-bedroom apartments to four-bedroom houses, will be built on an empty site at Barrowcliff Place in Monaco. At least half of the homes will be affordable through rent-to-buy and shared equity schemes. The National Party says its confidence in the Speaker of the House has been severely shaken. National's Deputy Leader Paula Bennett stormed out of Parliament's debating chamber this afternoon in frustration over Trevor Mallard's behaviour as Speaker. He's introduced a new system of discipline, deducting questions from MPs who interrupt proceedings. During question time today, National's Jerry Brownlee objected after Mr Mallard took five questions away from the opposition. Mr Brownlee said the Speaker was effectively hampering democracy and Mrs Bennett jumped to his defence. A Kapiti Coast District Councillor has been found guilty of indecently assaulting a council staff member. David Scott, who's 71, has been on trial for rubbing his genitals against the woman staff member during a council morning tea. Scott has been remanded on bail until sentencing next month. Those are the headlines. I'm back at six. Emil next, uh, answering a question from you, Reese. if you're listening. But before that, this is big. Uh, for exporters and I guess importers and all of us really, the European Union, the world's biggest trading bloc, has given the green light to start negotiations. That's just negotiations at this stage for a trade deal with New Zealand and Australia. But while a free trade agreement could pump billions of dollars into the economy, well, one to two billion, not everyone is happy. One cheese producer says a trade deal would hurt the speciality cheese industry. Looking at this for us is our Deputy Political Editor Chris Bramwell. The award-winning Whitestone Cheese Company produces a range of products from blue to feta in its Wamaru-based factory. Its chief executive, Simon Berry, says for specialty cheesemakers in New Zealand, news that a trade deal with the EU is a step closer isn't that great. Our domestic market is being flooded with tariff-free, cheap, subsidised specialty cheeses into our domestic market, and these guys work on reciprocal deals. So when they go into Europe, they negotiate a tariff-free export for us and in return an import tariff free to New Zealand so it actually makes things worse off for our specialty producers. Simon Berry says it isn't a level playing field as New Zealand producers unlike their European counterparts aren't subsidised. Local cheesemakers also have to pay global prices for their raw products. We can't compete when it comes to price or cost of production and and so on so um, our, our products domestically are more expensive than the, the free imported European products. So it's great for the commodity negotiation, 
But when it comes through to the specialty side of things, we'd like to see tariffs put in place at our border to prevent these cheap imports being flooded in. But the Trade Minister, David Parker, says that's not going to happen. And I doubt that we would. No, I, I, I wouldn't think we would. Do you uh, understand their concerns? Though? Uh, I think New Zealand's on a route from volume to value, that we've got increasingly sophisticated cheese products that we will sell into the New Zealand market and into the European market in the future. I think it's an overall upside for the dairy industry. The EU is New Zealand's third largest export market. Export New Zealand's Executive Director Catherine Beard says a trade deal will bring benefits across the board. She doesn't see any problem with geographic indications, regional products protected by EU rules like Parmesan or Champagne. In fact, she thinks it could work in New Zealand's favour. Because we do, for example, have quite a global reputation around Sauvignon Blanc and in particular Marlborough and particular wine regions in New Zealand. So I think our wine industry has been working really hard over the years to build a reputation for quality. And if we can have our geographic areas recognised in these sorts of trade agreements, then you know, that gives them a whole lot of protection and takes that brand globally. The chief executive of Horticulture New Zealand, Mike Chapman, says a lot of produce is sent to Europe and New Zealand is one of the few countries that still faces barriers in that market. Onions, apples, kiwi fruit will all benefit from this. Uh, plus it will open up opportunities for other vegetables and fruit that might not be being exported to Europe. And it also means that in terms of dealing with any issues related to access of our produce to Europe, there will be mechanisms in place to help with that. New Zealand onions currently get slapped with a near 10% EU import duty, kiwi fruit close to 9% and sparkling wine 32 euros for every 100 litres. The EU Trade Commissioner will visit in June for the formal launch of the trade talks with the first sit-down discussions in Brussels in July. Let's go for our daily update on business news. Emil Donovan joining us from Wellington. Hi Emil, some welcome news for dairy farmers. Hi John, yeah that's right, so Fonterra today lifted its forecast payout for the season just ended by 20 cents, so it's uh, going to be $6.75 per kilo of milk solids, that's mainly due to strong global demand, particularly from China. It's also picking an even higher payout next year of $7 a kilo, uh, which will be the fourth highest milk price on record. That, though, was uh, news to some analysts who have a bit more uh, wary a view of the Chinese economy. They're picking it to slow down quite substantially over the next year. And they think Fonterra is being a little bit optimistic, though they're not saying it's beyond the realms of possibility. But either way, it's pretty good news. You know, it'll mean three years in a row of uh, prices above $6 a kilo. And according to the economists that we've spoken to, it means that most dairy farms, most Fonterra farms at least, will be uh, cash flow positive. So there you go. Yeah, that's good news for them. Um, we talked about steel and tube last night, Emil, and you were going to update us. What is the latest? Well, the latest news is pretty grim, John. Uh, it's announced an underlying loss of $38 million in the year to June. That is a bit of a shock as they were earlier projecting a $31 million gain. Now, we talked about the causes yesterday. We talk, talked about restructuring costs, um, a bad time for the plastics business, and so on. In addition to that, it's also breached its banking arrangements, so uh, in a bit of a tough spot there, Steel and Tube. Now, the board is really trying to wash its hands of this now. They've asked the bank to waive the breach. Uh, it's looking for a, a fresh start. It's, it's described these as legacy issues which it's had to clean out. And it does think that uh, it's wiped the slate clean and that some of the measures that it's put in place put them into a, a better position for the next year. Um, that being said, uh, their share price ended down 18%. So wow. that's not great news for no, them. No, it's not. And, no, it's um, not. And there is one nasty surprise in the pipeline too. They still don't know what kind of penalty they will face for mislabeling steel mesh. So not quite over the hill yet. Right, thank you, Emil. We appreciate it. Uh, now, look, this was uh, we were talking about petrol prices last night, and we got a question from uh, Reese Spears, who is a listener or a viewer. And the question from Reese is: Can someone explain the correlation between oil and fuel prices? A really good question, Reese. Last time, Reese says the petrol price was this high ten years ago. Oil was at one hundred and forty dollars a barrel. Currently, the oil price per barrel is approximately seventy dollars. How does that work? Uh, this will be seriously scary if oil hits its previous high. We could be looking at $4 a litre for 91. Can you explain this? Take it away, Emil Donovan. <laughs> 
Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's a really interesting question. It has a really complicated answer, but um, the boiled down version, uh, courtesy of Mark Stockdale of the AA, is as follows. So the first thing to remember on this is that cars don't burn crude oil, they burn petrol. Um, that, of course, is a byproduct, but they, and so the two are related, but they're not the same thing. So when we're talking about this, we should really be talking about the price of refined fuel, uh, petrol and diesel, you know, um, which we would call the commodity price. Now, at the moment, the commodity price for petrol is about 95 US dollars a barrel. And 10 years ago, when Reese is talking about, it was a bit above $140. The important thing to keep in mind here is that what you pay at the pump is not just influenced by the commodity price. The actual cost of the petrol only constitutes about a third of what you'd pay at the pump. Uh, about half of what you pay uh, is taxes, and the remainder is margins uh, that are tacked on by the petrol companies to make sure they're in the black, and shipping costs. Uh, so in the past 10 years, taxes on petrol have gone up lots and margins have gone up a bit as well. And there have also been 10 years of inflation. There's also been 10 years of inflation, which is pretty much why we're paying more in dollar terms now than when fuel was $140 a barrel. Then you add into that that the New Zealand dollar was stronger back then, which means that now we're getting less fuel for every dollar that we pay, and it starts to make a bit more sense. So a good rule of thumb really to follow is that Every dollar that the commodity price goes up, the price that you pay at the pump goes up by about one cent. So if petrol uh, jumped to $140 a barrel tomorrow, we wouldn't end up paying $4 a barrel, uh, a litre rather, we'd end up paying about $2.70. So uh, it's still a lot, but it's not quite a one-to-one -one ratio. Nice explanation, Emil. Yeah, it does. Reese, <laughs> I hope you're happy. Thank you. Good question, Reese, and good answer, Emil. Right, what do the markets do just before we go? Uh, the NZX50 is down 60 points, that's 0.69 of a percent, it ended on 8.553 and the dollar's buying 69 US cents, 91.4 Australian and 51.4 pence. Emil Donovan, thank you very much indeed. It's 18 minutes to 6. The Christchurch Mayor says council staff underestimated the impact chlorination would have on the city. After finding that some below ground wellheads could become contaminated during heavy flooding, the council decided in January to chlorinate all drinking water for 12 months. That chlorination began in late March and almost two months later following complaints from hundreds of residents about the taste. The mayor is asking staff to look at lowering chlorine levels. Logan Church reports. Avonside mother of three, Michelle Linda Shuka, says chlorination is having a dramatic impact on her family. When I'm the last one to have a shower at night, and when I my eyes are so sore, they are so dry and flaky, and my skin, I've noticed that that's my experience. My, my children end up having crooked stomachs, and my hair's quite brittle as well, so it's, it's like swimming in a swimming pool. And Michelle isn't the only one. RNZ has spoken to many residents who object to the taste or believe it's caused skin and eye irritations. Council staff have repeatedly said people should barely be able to taste the chlorine. This is what the Council City Services General Manager, David Adamson, told us near the end of April. We've found that it uh, disappears over time or it decreases over time um, as, uh, as the, the, the network uh, accepts the chlorine and uh, reacts to it in the first instance. So there will be some people that will notice it. Uh, the majority of people uh, we don't believe will see much difference. Tui Paris from South New Brighton has a similar story to Michelle. We've had to buy bottled water because um, it's been giving everyone upset tummies. We stopped um, drinking the, um, the water out the tap or using the um, the water filter jug and bought bottled water and as soon as that happened everybody saw stomach f disappeared. The council says on its website that the chlorine dosage rate at each pump station is roughly one parts per million but it does fluctuate. Today Mayor Leanne Dalzell says she is asking staff to draw up a new program that would drop chlorine levels given the number of residents who say they are having issues. So does that mean staff got their initial assessments wrong? Staff were optimistic and we're, in, in many respects, trying to reassure people based on their experience after the earthquake. So I think that, that staff have underestimated the impact that it's had 
on significant areas of Christchurch. Leanne Dalzell says it is still her end goal to remove chlorine from Christchurch's drinking water, but couldn't give any assurances when or even if that will happen. I mean, I've already had this conversation with you. We've got central government sitting in behind uh, considering the results of the Havelock North inquiry. I want to do everything within my power to remove the chlorine that we are putting into the water as a result of losing our drinking water standards. What happens when central government makes its decisions remains to be seen. Leanne Dalzell says staff are aiming to have a new chlorination programme on the desk of the council's water assessor by the end of today. The final decision if chlorine levels will drop and by how much is up to them. In Christchurch for Checkpoint, Logan Church. Nationals Deputy Leader Paula Bennett stormed out of the debating chamber in Parliament this afternoon in frustration over the Speaker's behaviour. Since becoming Speaker, the Labour MP Trevor Mallard has introduced a new system of discipline, deducting questions from MPs who interrupt proceedings. During question time today, Nationals Jury Brownlee objected after Mr Mallard took five questions away from the opposition. Mr Brownlee said the Speaker was effectively hampering democracy and Mrs Bennett also jumped to his defence. The exchange went back and forth, back and forth, before ultimately prompting this. We're speaking to the point of order. No, there's no point of order. If the member wants a further supplementary, she can take it. If not, we'll no, move on. I'm leaving. <laughs> what a waste of time. For how long? Thank you. Soon after that walkout, Paula Bennett spoke to reporters outside and she was asked why she left. The unpredictability, it's kind of frustrating. It's certainly our job to hold the government to account. And question time's a really important part of that. And we walk in, we don't know how many questions we're going to get that day because the rules seem to change every day as to how many we'll have, what kind of rulings will be made. And so it does, it gets to a certain level of frustration. So when questions had been taken off me, I just sort of felt like it wasn't worth sitting there uh, and seeing us not being able to give that kind of scrutiny to the government. You're the deputy opposition leader. You've walked out of question time saying it was a waste of time. The shadow leader of the House is accusing the Speaker of preventing the, question, uh, the opposition from holding the government to account. It sounds a lot to me like you have no confidence in the Speaker. Well, it was just a waste of time me staying there when he'd taken away my, um, my supplementary questions. So I had more questions to give. Um, he had taken them away for a reason I'm still not quite sure of. Um, however, it was acceptable for the government to be making uh, random statements and perhaps not following the rules completely. So from my perspective, um, I was, uh, look, I'd been building for a while, really disappointed that we don't get to have, you know, I think a fair democracy, and I suppose that's why I walked out. Yeah, but I'm about, you, just to be clear, though, I'm about to go back and do my budget debate, so you, you can go and listen. But do you still <laughs> you have, have confidence in the speaker? Because it sounds like you don't. Oh, look, um, you know, that's something that that we will discuss. I mean, I'm not. I, I do have confidence in him. I just don't agree with him, and I would like an opportunity to be um, putting that forward. But national like will discuss. Losing, it sounds like you're national will discuss whether. Him. That would be fair to say that I certainly feel a level of frustration and a level of disappointment um, and that uh, yeah I do have questions about how question time so, has been. So you'll be at, at caucus next week, week or, or when the house returns sorry you'll be discussing that with all of your colleagues as to whether you will continue supporting the speaker with your confidence? Oh look we'll continue um, as the opposition and I think we'll make our, our points to the speaker and we've got a pretty awesome um, you know shadow leader of the house and Jerry Brownlee so you know I don't want to be making any rash um, decisions right now I just made one to walk out because I was feeling a bit frustrated so perhaps I'll, um, I'll discuss that with my colleagues as to where it goes. And Paula Bennett did later return to Parliament, not that later actually, not that much later, and had to apologise for her leaving remarks. The Speaker Trevor Mallard says to date National MPs have actually been awarded 22 more questions than they otherwise would have. Meanwhile, Jerry Brownlee, who uh, you would have heard being described there uh, by Paula Bennett as the shadow leader of the House, has just released a letter to Trevor Mallard saying National's confidence in the Speaker has been severely shaken. The letter also complains about a recent story in the media claiming an unknown National MP called the Prime Minister a stupid little girl in the debating chamber. The comment cannot be heard on the recording and National MPs claim they said no such thing. Mr Brownlee says prompting stories about unverified events is unacceptable for the Speaker as in, and is demanding Mr Mallard explain his role in the story before 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. We will let you know tomorrow evening 
what happens. It's uh, coming up to 10 minutes to 6. A Māori woman who has worn a facial moko for 10 years is backing a life coach for also wearing one, despite being Pākehā. Sally Anderson has sparked outrage on social media for flaunting her moko kowai or Māori chin tattoo on her company's website and she's since removed the images on some of her branding but the debate about whether or not Pākehā should wear traditional moko has divided many in the Māori community. Te Mani Kōrahi reporter Te Aniwa Huri Hanganui has more. Pākehā life coach Sally Anderson has been accused of stealing a traditional Māori taonga by many, including some of the country's leading Māori academics. Ms Anderson was a victim of gang rape in the 1980s, and according to the Stuff website, she said the mokokowai was a symbol of triumph and new beginnings. But Lynette Olsen, who also wears a mokokowai, says the taonga should only be worn by Māori women. In the years that I've had my mokokowai, I've travelled the world. You know, we can go anywhere in the world and we're the only people that wear this is wahine Māori. I guess uh, to have it used the way she's chosen to use it, it doesn't sit well with me. And I, uh, uh, in that mokokowai is our genealogy. You know, I don't know how wahine Pākehā can do that. Tania Cotter from Wairua has had her mokokowai for 10 years. It represents mana wahine and her feminine essence. But she doesn't have a problem with Pākehā women wearing them too because she believes Māori taonga need to be shared. We share our culture. We want to share it. Well, we want the reo to be compulsory in schools. So we're asking for Pākehā people to learn our reo. So why aren't we allowing them to take on our taonga tukuihu of tāmoko? Tania Cotter says her ancestors even gave European settlers tāmoko. My ancestors and our tipuna set the precedent way back in the 1800s when they gifted to many Pākehā. Um, Pākehā men were gifted moko kanohi. A leading moko artist, Mark Kōpua, says Māori taonga are often exploited and this is no exception. But he says in special circumstances he wouldn't deny giving a Pākehā woman a moko kōai. There have been instances in the 1900s where various uh, queer Pākehā that have lived a predominantly Māori life uh, have been given moko by that Māori community because of their contribution to the community. Now, if I was to come across an individual who had those similar circumstances backing her, then I would have no hesitation to follow the advice and the direction of the hapu. A leading Indigenous Studies researcher, Mera Lee Penehira, says she has nothing against Sally Anderson. She just wants Māori women to retain an important cultural practice for themselves. It is about wahine Māori maintaining the integrity of moko kauai for wahine Māori. It's not really about Sally, it's not really about Sally's artists. It is about maintaining that we know this is importantly whakapapa related. RNZ has contacted Sally Anderson for comment but has not yet received a response. Mo te hōtaka o te ahi pōnei, ko te aniwa, hurihanga nui aho. Seven minutes to six. Manchester has been marking one year since the suicide bomber killed 22 people at an Ariana Grande concert. Thousands of people gathered in the central city to pay their respects to the victims in a multi-faith service attended by the Duke of Cambridge and the Prime Minister Theresa May. Uh, it was held at Manchester's Cathedral. A nationwide minute's silence was also observed. With more from Manchester, here's the BBC's Alan Little. It was a service in keeping with the values this city articulated so powerfully in the days after the bombing. At its heart, the enduring grief of the families gathered here. And a quiet, restrained pride in Manchester's resilience and defiance. A city united in its determination not to poison civic life with hatred. May we be able to view our lost friends with eyes wise with calming grace. Forgive them the damage we were left to inherit. Free ourselves from the chains of forlorn resentment. Bring warmth again to where the heart has frozen. The place of worship was Christian, the commemoration multi-faith, reflecting the diversity that is central to Manchester's identity. 
We pray for understanding and for the strength and courage to cope with what has happened. As we share with one another, help us to find comfort in our companionship and active love. The altar held 22 candles, one for each of the dead. They were made from wax that accumulated from candles left at St Anne's Square in the days after the attack. The service was broadcast to crowds outside. At 2.30, they stood for a national minute's silence. Inside, Prince William read from the New Testament. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. The TV cameras stayed off the faces of the bereaved, respecting their right to privacy in their grief. The Bishop of Manchester spoke for them. Whilst we sometimes overwhelm people with care and support in the immediate aftermath of injury or loss, we then withdraw our interest taken off in other directions. Too often, just a few months on from an horrific event, those still bearing the pain are left feeling unsupported. Some are even made to feel guilty at not having got over it as rapidly as the rest of us would find comfortable. God has no timetable for our recovery from tragedy. He knows that the hurt we experience can last a lifetime. The report from the BBC. The diary of a First World War veteran will, will be returned to New Zealand after 40 years of campaigning by his family. Hartley Valentine Palmer is one of around 15 New Zealand vets whose diaries are held at Leeds University. Some families say the diaries were only lent to him and they've been asking for them back ever since. Tom Furley has more. It was worse than thunder. As we neared the shore, we could hear rifles and machine guns pouring out bullets. We had to get ready to go ashore. Signal came that the Australians who landed first captured four guns and prisoners in a bayonet charge. Several boatloads of both sides have been brought to the hospital ship. We landed on shore about 7pm and found that hundreds of wounded and dead were lying about. Rifle fire and cannon was terrific. Several shells landed near the boat as we were landing. We took up position and dug trenches all night. Those are the written words of Hartley Valentine Palmer, who landed in Anzac Cove on April 25th, 1915. During his time in the trenches at Gallipoli, he kept a daily diary. His written record remained with him until the 70s, when he came into contact with English historian Peter Little, who asked to read them. Well, he, he just thought he had them over thinking, that, you know, they're just going to take him away and bring them back shortly. So they took him away to England to read and sit. That's his daughter Margaret Kearns, who says despite the family writing and asking for it to be returned, nothing happened. Mr Palmer went to the media in 1984 and brought it to the attention of the government, but Mr Little indicated it wouldn't be returned. Mr Palmer died three years later, and the question of his missing diaries whereabouts remained until 2016, when a Nelson genealogy group found it in the Little collection at Leeds University. When we found out when it, where it was, we asked if we could have it back, and because I said no, could we have a copy? He said no. Could you copy it? We might. You know, it took, they dragged it out for about a year, and we finally got a digitised copy sent to us. And then after I got it put online at the Cenotaph, people queried it. Why haven't we got it back? Ms Kearns then asked the Ministry of Culture and Heritage to get involved and help return the physical diary to New Zealand. They were his and they, just should, they should be back in New Zealand. Well, it's not just their history, it's New Zealand's history. It's, it's our heritage. If you haven't got a past history, you haven't got a future. The university has now agreed to return the diary to New Zealand, as well as two others belonging to Cyril James Claridge and Clifford James Walsh. The chief historian at Manatu Taonga, Ministry for Culture and Heritage, Neil Atkinson, says they'll be kept in the Alexander Turnbull Library for safekeeping. There's different, you know, different purposes for this material, certainly from a research point of view, you know, digitisation and making that content available online is really valuable. Um, but ab absolutely for the families, you know, the, the, the would be nothing like the actual original being back in New Zealand and obviously being cared for for the future. For Margaret Kearns, a piece of history is coming home. It 
means it is coming back to where it should be in New Zealand. It's ours. The diaries are expected to arrive in New Zealand later this year. In the meantime, photos and transcriptions of the diary are available for the public to read online at the Auckland War Memorial Museum website. For Checkpoint, Tom Furley. And Tom's story brings us up to six o'clock. RNZ News at 6. Nga mihi o te po. Good evening. Ko Katrina Batten aho. Infected milk is shaping as one of the reasons Mycoplasma bovis has spread from Southland to Waikato. So far, 38 farms have been deemed to be infected with the cattle disease. Conan Young reports. Waste milk is sold to farmers rearing calves, but milk from cows with Mycoplasma bovis is highly infectious and the calves it's fed to are highly vulnerable. A Southland-based vet, Mark Bryan, led a study on waste milk and was surprised to find farms were selling it to others up to 130 kilometres away. He says a way to track the movement of waste milk needs to be introduced, similar to the system used to trace the movement of cattle. The industry body Dairy NZ has been educating farmers on ways to prevent the spread of embovis through infected milk. And it says Fonterra has now stopped selling any of its waste milk to those rearing calves. This is Conan Young. Meanwhile, the Ministry for Primary Industry says experts tracing the disease now believe its possible mycoplasma bovis was present on a Southland farm as far back as December 2015. The National Party says its confidence in the Speaker of the House has been severely shaken because of events in recent weeks. Its Deputy Leader Paula Bennett stormed out of the debating chamber in Parliament this afternoon in frustration over the Speaker's behaviour. Here's our political editor Jane Patterson. The Speaker, Labour's Trevor Mallard, has a new system of discipline deducting questions from MPs who interrupt proceedings. During question time today, Nationals' Jerry Brownlee objected after Mr Mallard took five questions away from the opposition. Mr Brownlee said the Speaker was effectively hindering democracy. Mrs Bennett also jumped to his defence and then walked out. Mr Brownlee also questions why Mr Mallard confirmed to the media outlet Stuff that he heard a National MP call the Prime Minister a stupid little girl in Parliament, even though the comment could not be heard on the recording of Question Time. Mr Mallard rejects any accusation of unfairness, saying under his system the National Party has received 22 extra supplementary questions. From Parliament, Jane Patterson. An award-winning cheese producer says a trade deal with the European Union will hurt the country's specialty cheese industry. The EU, the world's biggest trading bloc, overnight approved the beginning of negotiations with New Zealand and Australia. Whitestone Cheese Company produces a range of products from blue to feta in its Wamaru-based factory. Its chief executive, Simon Berry, says for cheesemakers in the specialty trade like his, the news of a trade deal with the EU is not that great. Our domestic market is being flooded with tariff-free, cheap, subsidised specialty cheeses into our domestic market, and these guys work on reciprocal deals. So when they go into Europe, they negotiate a tariff-free export for us and in return an import tariff-free to New Zealand. So it actually makes things worse off for our specialty producers. Simon Berry from the Whitestone Cheese Company in South Canterbury. The man who's accused of murdering Dunedin teenager Amber Rose Rush has had suspension lifted on a charge of indecent assault he's also facing. 30-year-old Venod Scanther is charged with murder along with four charges of threatening to kill and a charge of indecent assault. He remains in custody. The body of 16-year-old Amber Rose Rush was found by her family at their Corstaphine home in February. The names of the other victims and the other cases have been suppressed. The United Nations Secretary-General has revealed what he calls staggering figures on the number of people around the world needing immediate humanitarian aid. Speaking to the Security Council, Antonio Guterres says more than 128 million people are in need of urgent aid. He says 10 of the 13 major food crises last year were conflict-driven. In Yemen, for example, nearly 3 million women and children are acutely malnourished. And more than 8 million people do not know whether their next meal is coming from. Antonio Guterres says access is being blocked to those delivering health care and aid by warring parties, while civilians in conflict zones are also being subject to horrific human rights violations. The American author Philip Roth has died. He died in New York of congestive heart failure at the age of 85. 
Roth produced more than 30 books in his more than 50 years as a writer. He was best known for his 1969 novel Portnoy's Complaint, a first-person narrative about a young middle-class Jewish New Yorker. It's four and a half past six. Sport, the Black Ferns captain, says the awarding of professional contracts to the New Zealand women's rugby team is a big step forward, but the players desperately need more matches. After leading the Black Ferns to the World Cup last year, Fia Ao'o Fao Masili retired from the game, but she's had a change of heart and taken up one of the inaugural 28 contracts allocated today. Fa'a Marcelli says she'll continue working as a police officer and expects the level of the contracts worth between forty and $45,000 to improve over time. In time that will happen, but I think we just, for me personally, I would love more games in New Zealand, love more games, like 20 plus games a year for these girls to, um, to get through. Um, two, three games a year is not enough, I think we need um, multiple games and then other things will start coming. Fia o'o Fa'a Marcelli. The All Black Geordie Barrett will make his maiden first class appearance at centre with the Hurricanes joining the Crusaders in naming a weakened team for their Super Rugby match in Christchurch on Friday night. Injury and suspension has affected the two leading New Zealand sides for the top of the table clash. Barrett, who usually plays at full back, will move to the midfield with Nehi Milner Scudder shifting to full back and Julian Savier record on the right wing. And the Houston Rockets have beaten the Golden State Warriors 95-92 to to level the NBA's Western Conference Finals at two games apiece in the best of seven series. That's the news. Tonight on Nights, the return of Simon Morris at the movies. There's a window on the world of African Jews, and whether they're as welcome in Israel as other members of the faith. And we're squeezing as many of this choir as we can onto this week's sofa session. Super Tonic, with me, Brian Crump, after the news at seven. And for an eclectic mix of music, news, interviews and anything else we can squeeze into the hour, join me for Lately. After the extended news bulletin at ten, I'll be talking current affairs, foreign affairs, politics, music and the arts. For an eye on the world, Lately with Karen Hay, ten to eleven, weeknights on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow. Northland to Manawatu, including Coromandel Peninsula Bay of Plenty, Taupo, Taumaranui and Taihape. Showers some heavy with hail and thunderstorms easing for a time overnight and tomorrow morning. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay fine breaks, a few showers mainly about the ranges. Horofenua to Wellington, Wairarapa, Marlborough and Canterbury. Long fine breaks, isolated showers in the afternoons and evenings, possibly heavy with hail but dry for the Canterbury Plains tomorrow. Nelson, mainly fine but showers about the western ranges spreading elsewhere tomorrow. Buller Westland and Fiordland, mostly fine today, however, showers developing in Fiordland this evening. Squally showers everywhere tomorrow with thunderstorms and hail. Heavy snow above 400 metres south of Haast tomorrow. Otago and Southland, showers with snow to 300 metres at times, clearing for a time this evening and overnight. Thunderstorms in the south tomorrow. And for the Chatham Islands, periods of rain with possible thunderstorms. It's almost eight minutes past six and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina Batten, and thank you everyone for being with us. Earlier in the programme, we revealed the Winton Farm, Southland, where Mycoplasma bovis is believed to have originated as early as 2015. Users of it 1,600 kilometres away on Waiheke Island, that's off the coast of Auckland. Vets on Waiheke manager Stephen Gilmore told us his wife, Alexandra, tried to visit the farm every six months, and his clinic had recently been visited and audited by MPI without warning. We want to talk to the Zestratons about why they use a vet on Waiheke when there are vets in Southland who are available with outstanding reputations. They have not returned our calls or texts. Meanwhile, infected milk could be one of the reasons the disease has spread from Southland to Waikato. Waste milk is sold by dairy farmers to those looking for a cheap way to feed their calves. But milk from cows with Mycoplasma bovis is highly infectious and the calves it's fed to are highly vulnerable. Conan Young explains. Wanting to get a handle on how much of a risk waste milk posed, Southland-based vet Mark Bryan led a study that found it was sold to farms up to 130 kilometres away and on average was sold to calf rearers within a 27 kilometre radius. 
I sort of naively thought I could probably goes five or ten k's, but it goes a long way. And some farmers have just too much of it, and uh, and they want rid of it. So you know, good milk that's not infected is is a great uh, source of feed for calves. But if it's containing M. bovis, it's it's highly infectious. While there's been a system for tracking livestock movements for the past six years, known as NATE, there's currently no system for tracking sales of the waste milk sold to those rearing calves. Mark Bryan says if the spread of M. bovis is going to be halted, that needs to change. We understand that NATE hasn't been well used, but in, if NATE is well used and if it worked well, we would technically know where every animal was uh, from a risk farm. And we should really implement a similar thing for milk. It's a high-risk product. And if we're not going to restrict the, the movement of milk, we should at least identify where it's going so that if there is, are any issues, we can go straight to the source or straight to the affected properties. The industry body, Dairy NZ, has been educating farmers on ways to prevent the disease's spread through infected milk. Its spokesperson, Chris Morley, says while the milk sent to Fonterra is traced, waste milk sold to other farms in order to feed calves was off the radar and hard to track. The only way to do that is often using people's memories and, and books and, and sort of notebooks and things, and it can be quite challenging, particularly if, if people are collecting from a number of different farms on different days and probably could, be, could get quite close to impossible at times. Chris Morley says Fonterra has now stopped selling any of its waste milk to those rearing calves. He says there are three main approaches to avoiding embovis in the milk fed to calves. One is to use calf milk replacer, which is powdered milk. You can't get mycoplasma bovis if you're feeding calf milk replacer. Another way of managing that risk is through uh, using a pasteuriser, and that's a, a type of heat treatment. The third way of managing the risk is adding um, a product called citric acid, which is essentially lemon juice. Asked if there was a need for a system to trace waste milk, the Minister for Primary Industries, Damien O'Connor, said nothing was off the table. I think everything now in the farming systems will be tracked very, very carefully, uh, be it animals, uh, be it milk, um, you know, or be it cows and, and their transfer around farms. Damien O'Connor says a decision will be made on Monday about whether M. bovis will be managed or whether an attempt will be made to eradicate it completely. For Checkpoint, call Conan Young Tene. 11 and a half past six. A stoush over a proposed housing New Zealand complex in an expensive Auckland suburb shows no sign of being resolved, with Epsom MP David Seymour doubling down on his contentious remarks. The ACT Party leader sent a letter to locals last week with a line warning that some of the future tenants would have social and mental health issues. Our political reporter Gia Garrick explains. In Banff Avenue, Epsom sit two run-down social buildings built in the 70s. Housing New Zealand wants to bowl them and build a five-storey, 25-unit complex in their place. The government's housing agency has applied for resource consent and many locals are not happy about the prospect of new neighbours. The stories, what some of these previous tenants are like, are hair-raising. They're really, really horrible experiences. We're not actually totally against it, just so long as um, we know there aren't um, too many people who cause trouble. There is going to be a lot of uh, law and order and security issue. I mean, my children are already, we don't, we don't allow them to pass that area as it is at night. And we pick and drop them up from the bus stop if, you know, we don't feel safe as it is in that area with 25 more residents coming in there, it's going to be a problem. Local MP David Seymour has stepped into the fray calling a public meeting a week ago. But it was the invite to the event which has been controversial. The letter lists reasons why residents might oppose the complex, one being that some future tenants will have social and mental health issues. Mental health advocates like Sean Robinson, who heads up the Mental Health Foundation, say that's misguided and irresponsible. Many of the constituents that Mr Seymour wrote to uh, will currently be experiencing mental health problems themselves. So to kind of equate it with poverty and uh, undesirable people in your community, it's completely unacceptable. It's ignorant uh, and it's completely counterproductive. But David Seymour is doubling down on his comments saying locals have genuine concerns. They've had public urination, people yelling and intimidating them, uh, women being grabbed while going running, parents fearful for their children in the area, bearing in mind that this is a street with a major church and a major school on it. 
uh, obviously people are concerned. The Housing Minister Phil Twyford is appalled. I think David Seymour is um, pandering to people's worst prejudices and stirring up nimbyism and the thing that I find most offensive about it is he's stigmatising mental illness in the process. Housing New Zealand says the current buildings should have been demolished some time ago and redevelopment is a better use of taxpayers' money than refurbishment. It says it got in touch with affected residents about the development in January and then again this month. But Mr Seymour says there hasn't been proper consultation. Now the agency is working with David Seymour to set up a community representative group and they're planning to meet before the end of the month. From Parliament for Checkpoint, Gia Garrick. From Parliament and Epsom to Taranaki, where questions are being asked about the involvement of the new Plymouth Mayor in a meeting about the sale of reserve land in the city, including the transfer of $2.25 million to a private golf club. Arrangements for the meeting revealed in emails released to RNZ under the Local Government Official Information and Meetings Act come as the Council considers 4,000 submissions on the potential sale of the reserve land to developers. And as Robin Martin reports, a former mayor and at least one current councillor believe there's been a lack of transparency. Here is our Taranaki reporter. The email show that Rudy Gesterkamp, the author of a confidential proposal involving the reserve land, tried to arrange a meeting with the mayor of New Plymouth, Neil Holdham, early in November 2017. The proposal involved the council paying the New Plymouth Golf Club, where Mr Gesterkamp is a member, $2.25 million dollars to facilitate the Fitzroy Golf Club giving up its lease on the reserve land, making it easier for the council to sell it. On November the 2nd, Mr Gesterkamp, a former colleague of Mr Holdham's at the Lions Company Power Co, emailed the Mayor to set up the meeting. Hi Neil, after our talk the other day my head has been spinning at the long list of win-wins if you pursue a different approach that are going begging for all three parties and the citizens of New Plymouth. I think your offer to Fitzroy should be different. Could we catch up some time for me to explain? The pair emailed back and forth throughout the day before agreeing to meet at 11am the following Monday, November the 6th. But both men deny that the meeting ever took place. When a document detailing the proposal, headlined Highly Confidential and Urgent, surfaced in March this year, Mr Holdham told RNZ he had no knowledge of it. I've, I've never seen the document offering the Fitzroy Golf Club anything to do with NPDC apart from the historic lease documents. So, so no. So there's never been a proposal on the table to pay the, the New Plymouth Golf Club to pick up those those members to facilitate um, them vacating the lease somewhat earlier. I'm not aware. No, I'm, I'm not aware of of any letter or any agreement. The mayor went on to invite RNZ to file an official information request which revealed the November email exchange about arrangements to meet Mr Gesterkamp. You know, I would encourage Radio New Zealand to send a local government information request for any document um, that fits that description because that does not sound like a council document um, or, or anything that, that I've had any involvement in. And if you've got any further questions, send them through to Jacqueline. Um, I've got one further question. Have you got... <laughs> but later that same afternoon in March, the council's acting chief executive, Alan Bird, released a statement saying that he and the mayor had met with the New Plymouth Golf Club and discussed the Fitzroy land. We listened to them, but no agreements or commitments were made. We advised New Plymouth Golf Club the proposal relating to the land would be subject to the 10-year plan consultation process, and the MPDC would continue to engage directly with the Fitzroy Golf Club. Although Mr Holdham contacted RNZ to say he had made a mistake, that excuse doesn't wash with former Mayor David Lean. The Mayor can talk, who, talk to who he likes to. You don't, su don't suggest you haven't had a bar of anything when in fact history proves that you have. An opponent of the reserve land sale, Mr Lean believes the confidential proposal smacks of council involvement. Well, if you have a look at that document and check on about page four or point, uh, page five, it actually says that the mayor is driving this. It actually says that the mayor is driving this. And the information about the timing required for the long-term plan submissions, that's hardly uh, the stuff that happens um, outside of council. So it's got to come from somewhere in council. Veteran councillor John McLeod thinks all the cards should be on the table. I think all council business should be open and forward and um, 
everything should be open and particularly to councillors. Councillors should be privy to what the hell is going on. Councillor Gordon Brown says only the mayor will know what really happened. What I will say is that I think it's important for the mayor to be very transparent and uh, keep his councillors informed in any meetings uh, of such a significant nature um, all the time. And the relationship with the media is an important one as well. And that's based, uh, both relationships are based on transparency and honesty. Mr Brown says Mr Holdham has given councillors an assurance that he had no input into Mr Gesterkamp's proposal. Councillor Marie Pierce says she has no problem with the Mayor meeting with people to hear their views on particular issues because eventually it would have to come before the Council anyhow. Ms Pierce felt Mr Holdham, who is a first-time Mayor, is still coming to terms with the job. He's a new mayor and um, he hadn't been a councillor prior to being elected as mayor. I think it takes a while to um, understand how local government works. I think he's having a learning curve. Mayor Holdham has declined an interview and referred RNZ to his communications manager who says the meeting never took place. Mr Gesterkamp says he was hoping to meet the mayor but it was called off. We were working towards that. Um, but then he rang me back and said, actually, I'm canning the meeting, Rudy, because on reflection, we're thinking that him and his council, senior council staff are thinking it's not a good idea for him and I to meet. Mr Gasterkamp's proposal for the two golf clubs to amalgamate went no further when the Fitzroy Golf Club rejected it. But as part of its draft long-term plan, the New Plymouth Council is still proposing to sell part of Paringa Reserve including half of the Fitzroy Golf Club, to housing developers for $35 million. A record 4,000-plus submissions have been made on the plan and hearings begin next week. I nā mutu mō te hōtaka o te ahiahi, ko Robin Martinaho. 21 minutes past six. With petrol prices around the country hitting highs, commuters are going out of their way to find the cheapest price at the pump. Last week, the cost of 91 octane in Wellington in the South Island hit $2.30, beating previous high set in 2013. Now, it's less than a month since Energy Minister Megan Woods summons BP executives to Parliament after a leaked email revealed pricing tactics on the Kapiti coast. A lot of interest in what was going on north of Wellington. So Katie Scotcher drove up the coast today to see if anything has changed. The first stop on my petrol price road trip was the small town of Ōtaki, where there are two petrol stations. Just yesterday, the price of petrol was around $2.30 a litre, but today it was down to $2.15 a litre at both. Ōtaki local Kayano Barrett says the price of petrol in her town is way too much. My car's 2.2 litre, so I can't really... You know, it, it's too expensive for me. And I'm a student, so I can't actually... I don't have a full-time job, so I can't, I can't actually afford it at all. How much does a full tank of petrol cost for you? For me, 150 how, how much did it used to cost? 130 After speaking with me, Miss Barrett got into her car and drove north to Levin to fill up her car with petrol. Down the coast in Parapara Umu, we find the cheapest petrol of the day at $2.09 a litre at an independent station at the beach. Despite this, all of the other stations in the area were sitting at around $2.18 a litre. Alan Cannell from Parapara Umu says he's also noticed a difference in the price of petrol. Maybe it's due to the international cost of oil and exchange rate. Maybe it is. I know it's highly dependent on that, but... When you see how low the independents can set their prices comparatively, you have to ask the question, you know, are they really profiteering? Further south, they found the most expensive fuel in Porirua, $2.22 a litre. Porirua woman Melania Tude drives between Porirua and Upper Hutt every day for work and says the difference in price between the two towns is appalling. This morning I came from Upper Hutt where it was nearly $2.30 so I put in $60, didn't really fill my car up and I came over to Waitangirua and went to Cannons Creek Mobile and it was two twenty. And it's not just the Lower North Island that's experiencing changing petrol prices. Yesterday, a Wanaka petrol station hit a high of $2.44 a litre, while in Rotorua, some petrol stations are yet to hit the $2 a litre mark. Challenge down Malfoy Road is currently selling fuel for $1.99 per litre. In Wellington for Checkpoint, call Katie Scotcher 10A.
Facebook's founder has fronted up to the European Parliament in Brussels and apologised for failing to do enough to stop its technology from being misused. Mark Zuckerberg agreed to appear before MPs in a bid to explain how the political consultancy Cambridge Analytica got hold of the personal data of millions of Facebook users. The session was testy at times over the format of the questioning with some MPs accusing Mr Zuckerberg of being evasive. With more, here's the BBC's Kevin Connolly. Softly spoken and soberly suited, Mark Zuckerberg opened his question and answer session at the European Parliament with a straightforward apology. His company did a lot of good, he argued, in bringing people together. But it hadn't done enough to prevent the harmful use of its technology. And that, he acknowledged, was wrong. And that goes for fake news, foreign interference in elections, and developers misusing people's information. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility and that was a mistake, and I'm sorry for it. The session that followed offered none of the cut and thrust of cross-examination, though. For more than an hour, one after the other, the leaders of the various factions that make up the European Parliament each asked a list of questions. Mr Zuckerberg sat in silence, diligently taking notes, and when the questions were exhausted, he was allowed to group the issues together as he pleased, dealing with them in general terms in an uninterrupted address. When he'd finished, the frustration the parliamentarians felt at the format was clear. The Green MEP, Philippe Lambert, complaining that his specific questions had not been dealt with. I asked you six yes and no questions. I got not a single answer. Yeah. And of course, well, you asked for this format, well, for a reason. Leaving Mr Zuckerberg to promise further answers in writing. It remains to be seen if Facebook will deal with the highly specific questions about data protection and election tampering that Mr Zuckerberg was asked. But his advisers may feel that he escaped from this session relatively unscathed, as he had from congressional hearings last month in Washington. That was the BBC's Kevin Connolly and Mark Zuckerberg's appearance in Brussels came three days before tough new EU rules on data protection are due to take effect. Three days after their wedding, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex have stepped out for the first public engagement as a married couple at a garden party at Buckingham Palace. The occasion was Prince Charles's 70th birthday. Goodness gracious. But all eyes were on Meghan Markle and her first outing as a new royal. The BBC's veteran royal correspondent, Nicholas Wichtel, was there. She's formally part of the family now, three days into married life, and Meghan was at Buckingham Palace for a very early 70th birthday celebration for her father-in-law and his charity work, led by Harry, but nearly ruined by a passing bumblebee. To save an input, sorry, <laughs> that bee really got me. <laughs> and then it was time to practice the art of being royal, the small talk that will be such a feature of Meghan's working life. It's all about putting people at their ease, engaging, preferably with sincerity, listening and moving on. Not unfamiliar territory for an actress. Unsurprisingly, the reviews were good. Very personable, yeah. very warm, very Just nice. down to earth. Yes. They were really friendly yeah. as a couple. And it's really lovely. Yeah. Yeah. We said congratulations and then they said thank you and they looked really happy. Talking of looking happy reminds us of the formal wedding photographs featuring Harry, Meghan and the bridesmaids and page boys. The photographer has revealed the secret of getting the children to cooperate. The, the kids came onto the set. I immediately just shouted out, who likes Smarties? And then everybody, hands up, smiles, even some of the adults, I think, put their hands up. And um, so that was our magic word of the day. Back at Buckingham Palace, Harry and Meghan were leaving. So some family farewells, and then the courtier bowed. That's something else the former Ms Meghan Markle will need to get used to. Nicholas Witchell from the BBC. Just before we go tonight, a lot of feedback on Zach's story, uh, his experience, his first-hand experience of kiwi fruit picking. Uh, Chris Richardson says, Chris from Wellington says, the kiwi fruit industry's claim that people earn $21 an hour is based on what experienced pickers earn on what you actually pick basis. It's not an actual hourly rate paid, therefore the industry representatives claim that $21 is enough is disingenuous at best. If $21 an hour is enough, then why don't kiwi fruit orchards pay $21 an hour as a fixed rate? 
and advertise that on all the signs around Bay of Plenty that are crying out for pickers. They won't because they're not prepared to pay more than the minimum wage to inexperienced pickers who would be expected to bust their back for the absolute pittance that comes with this sort of work. So much feedback saying that kind of thing tonight. We really appreciate you hearing. Sorry, really appreciate hearing from you. Have a great night. We'll be back tomorrow at 5. RNZ News Headlines at 6.30. Mycoplasma bovis may have been spread through infected milk, prompting calls to trace milk to used to feed cattle. The school decile funding system is staying while the government considers a new plan based on risk factors. And the National Party is up in arms about the Speaker disciplining MPs by clocking the number of questions they can ask. Our next news and weather is at 7. I know about euthanasia. It's one of those sticky moral topics. I wasn't sure what I was really signing up for. The issue is genuinely very difficult. The views of people who are both for and against a law change have to be taken seriously. I'm Alison Balance, and this week on Our Changing World, we find out about a citizen's jury on assisted dying. Tomorrow night, after the 9 o'clock news, during Nights with Brian Crump on RNZ National. This is trending now. We begin with Nine to Noon's political chat from Monday. Here's Lynn Freeman. What a week it's been. Our commentators, Matthew Hooten, who's managing director of the PR and lobbying firm Excelsior, and Mike Williams, former president of the Labour Party, with us this morning. Let's rip into this. I thought we'd start with Grant Robertson's uh, first budget. I read your assessment of it. Mike, you waxed lyrical about his performance. Why do you think he did well? I was mainly focusing on the person because... Um, to be quite honest with you, although I sit and assiduously listen to budgets normally, I was quite distracted on this one, so I was more like Joe Public than, uh, you know, a political junkie, which I am. And I thought he did very well. I thought it was a conservative budget, which suited the times. He needed to lay some, um, some trivia about the Labour Party. The Labour Party has traditionally been a far better manager of the economy than national. 